from Newcastle, and I was raised in Darlington. Um, and my family, all but one, is still here, and so I'm extremely fond of the Northeast. But like anyone else that has grown up here, I also hate the Northeast <laughs> in some ways. But I'm really pleased to be here today, and it is actually only the first time that I've been invited to speak at a feminist event on my home turf. <laughs> and I hope it's one of many more. And I've spent quite a bit of time up here recently because I was making a podcast series on, I don't know if you know the case of the murdered child, Ricky Allen in Sunderland, and the disgraced police fuck up, quite frankly, um, the scandal of the way that the child's mother, Sharon Henderson, a working class single mother from a rough estate was treated. And I think it just speaks volumes, doesn't it, to the way that the North East in general is seen as unimportant and Westminster tends not to care about the region and pay it no heed and how the North East, its, its citizens are blamed for Brexit and for racism and for pretty much everything else. And in fact, it's what's been imposed upon the citizens of the North East. And also the way that class prejudice runs very, very deep, very deep. And I think that that's something that we should discuss today and will be discussing today. Because although I'm supposedly, I mean, I was given the task to be the good news person, like me. <laughs> <laughs> do my best. <laughs> I should put a bet on the horses on the way here. You know? <laughs> but seriously, there is there is so much good news thanks to the way that feminists have been organising and the way that feminists have been creative forever, but in particular I think the last couple of decades to what I would describe as the worst misogynistic men's rights backlash that we've ever faced. Um, and there is no doubt that we have change the landscape when it comes to the way that women's bodies are mined by rich, privileged people, um, men in the main, of course, through surrogacy, through all aspects of the sex trade, through the breast milk trade, all of those issues that are really pertinent and will become more and more relevant. And so the, the good news bit is definitely that had it not been for feminism, this would be so much worse. And just imagine and then quickly get it out of your head what this world would be like without feminism. Oh my God. I mean, just the idea that there is no resistance to any of this misogyny and the terrible things happening to women and girls, um, it's unthinkable, isn't it? And that's why we're here. So I'm going to talk for, I think, 20 minutes. So somebody just give me the Nod. Perfect. Um, and then I'd love to have a conversation with you all about the issues that come up and hear what you think and hear what you've been doing also. Now, the sex trade in particular is a site of, I mean, it's both a consequence and um, it's a cause and a consequence of, of women's oppression, isn't it? If we didn't have male violence, if patriarchy didn't exist, then the sex trade would starve of oxygen. It wouldn't be possible to dehumanise uh, female bodies to the point of where you rent the inside uh, of a female who doesn't want sex with you for your own one-sided sexual pleasure. And that's why we have so, so few female hunters. And that's why we have relatively few men in prostitution and boys, but we do have them, of course. But obviously I'm going to talk about women and girls. And the difference that I can see from having campaigned on this for some time as part of the landscape of men's violence, because we have to see it as part of that, is this huge. The way that we are witnessing the beginnings of the pushback in Germany, for example, thanks to our German abolitionist sisters, in particular sex trade survivors, 
where that entrenched, very old system of legalization, which has been around since the 1970s in Germany, is now starting to crumble just to the edges. But it's enough for those decent politicians who've been lobbied by feminists and other human rights campaigners to say to Parliament, enough is enough. What further proof do you need in order to acknowledge this has been an unmitigated disaster? A year ago, I went to a conference in Munich organised by Melissa Farley, who's head of the Constitutional Research and Education NGO based in San Francisco. She works internationally, she's a psychologist, and she's done major studies on the harms to women in prostitution, and she's given us the hard facts about the levels of post-traumatic stress disorder, PTSD, amongst women and girls who've been prostituted. It goes without saying, but it's way higher when you turn veterans from war and conflict. And she organised this conference at which there were survivors and other experts speaking. And there were some politicians there including a green politician. A green politician in Germany listening to abolitionist arguments. And there were medical experts putting forward very coldly, which is what we needed, evidence about the terrible physical harm to women who were prostituted. Just straightforward evidence, irrefutable evidence. So you don't have to take an ideological position to be horrified at this. And then of course that leads you to an ideological position, unless you are a sociopath. So Germany started to question its own laws and policies. That, and you will have noticed this, anyone that campaigns on this area, you will have noticed that they aren't as loud or celebratory as the Dutch. You know, the Dutch used to brag constantly about its model. It was effectively set up for sex tourists, for their own GDP, the state that paid the pin. Germany was a bit more clinical than that, but nevertheless as harmful. But Germany sort of kept quiet about it to the point of where many of us didn't even know, myself included, that brothels were legalised as far back as the 70s. What we did start to understand when survivor activists and other abolitionists and police officers spoke out was that they had industrialised its sex trade to a point of incomprehensible, calculated horror, where there were mega brothels where 600 hunters could be accommodated, countless women on a conveyor belt in and out of there being brutalised and harmed. And they of course designed the two for the price of one type marketing of so-called sexual services. So you could during happy hour, as they called it, before the evening rush, go in and have two women for the price of one, that's what it means, that's what you get. And then they would have an all rounder 60 euros where you could go in, have a beer, a burger, and rape all the women that you can in the time before your dick falls off. So, we understood about this. We got the message because of the women in that country fighting against it. And we're now at a stage where one of the senior politicians, I think the, um, maybe some of you might correct me if I'm wrong, because you'd have read this on the same list I read it on. The senior, I think the Chancellor or, or one of the really senior politicians in Germany has said, that's it, we need to look at introducing the Nordic model or the abolitionist model, whatever we call it, where the demand is criminalised and those who are prostituted are assisted if they so wish, which of course they do, to get out of the sex trade. So this is such good news. Because of course once these empires crumble, the emperor's nakedness is exposed, isn't it? 
And we've seen it also with Holland. Again, Holland. 20, 15, 10 years ago, I'm going to Holland on a regular basis, writing in the newspapers about how terrible it is, how much worse it's got, how all the promises of the Dutch government have not only failed to be met, but in fact, the opposite happened. The Dutch government said back in 2000, when they introduced legalisation, and we know from that the window problems and the meat market situation, they said, well, it will reduce women being trafficked in from other countries. It increased. It will reduce the illegal market. That increased by threefold. It will mean that if you have the tipple zones, the street zones, they're properly policed, the women will go and register beforehand, oh. and there'll be no drug dealers and pimps. Guess what happened? Team in with them, because what woman <coughs> wants to go and sign off at a police station and say, I'm here as a prostitute for the moment? Well, that's why in Holland they didn't join the Red Thread Union, funded by the government as part of this propaganda machine. 25,000 prostituted people across the country, about 100 joined, and they were all quote unquote erotic dancers and lobbyists. Of course, the women are not going to be able to join a union. First of all, because what can a union do for women in prostitution? Absolutely nothing except for normalising protest. Secondly, which pimps or violent boyfriend or brothel owner is going to allow that? No. So that was defunded. And then there were some abolitionists that came out of the woodwork, including one woman who she's she's an amazing journalist, she always has been, with Arthur Van der Zee. And she wrote a book on trafficking and how trafficking is terrible. In about 2009, I went over there to interview her, to ask her about cross-border people. And she was saying, listen, I don't really like legalisation, but it's the best way to get, it's the least bad model. And now, this woman makes me look like a liberal about this. She's absolutely <laughs> rabid. She joined a group, she lives out in Den Haag, which is obviously near the Dutch Parliament, outside of Amsterdam. And she's together with a group of other abolitionists, all of whom are campaigning to shut down all the legal zones and help the women. And many of them are residents from Den Haag, where it's particularly bad that we don't get to hear about. We only get to hear about the Wallen, which is the, the main tourist area that you will see on TV or that you might have visited. And I thought at first, oh, I wonder if these people are the kind of not in my backyard types, because obviously it's not nice living near any prostitution area, none of them want it, including women in prostitution, they, they don't want it. Um, but no, they're not. They think that it's horrific that they're seeing women being abused on their doorstep. And that the Johns, the Hunters, the Pimps, are acting with impunity. So there's a really strong movement. And I was invited in 2017 to launch my book, The Pimping of Prostitution, in Amsterdam and in Den Haag. And it was like Never mind the vertigo, it felt like it, I was in a, on a different planet. I thought, my God, I'm here, launching this book, rather than shouting on the picket line about something terrible that's happening yet again um, in this god-awful country. So, that's not going to be rolled back now. Too many citizens know the truth, and they've had to open their eyes to it. And if you can get someone as bright and connected and as, as articulate as Renata van der Zee, thinking, well, it's, it's as good as we're going to get, let's just see if we can protect the women, then of course the majority of the citizens, and more importantly, the tourists are going to also believe the hype. They no longer believe it. Now one of the most important lessons that I learned from Amsterdam, and from which applies to the whole of Holland, was when I was out there looking at, it's an outfit called the Prostitution Information Centre, and it's run by women who call themselves sex workers. One of them dabbled in prostitution for five minutes, way back in the day, and they're now at the business end of it. So these women who dress the dress and talk the talk, 
people think that they are, in fact, sex workers. And they run the Prostitute Information Centre as a business. So it's a commercial business where people, so men in the main, but also the kind of tourist people, oh my God, isn't this quirky? Men and women, sometimes groups of women, whoever, will be fascinated with how on earth this system operates. So they'll go to the PRC, and they'll be given a load of goss, and then they'll leave. But I was thinking, but it's a tiny little office. They can't possibly be spreading this propaganda <coughs> to every single tourist that comes here. Anyway, I booked a tour guide, my own personal tour guide, <coughs> to take me around and show me the entire prostitution area. And of course, he had no idea that I was there to do anything other than just put a quash an interest that I had in it. And he was a bright young man. He'd done a degree, he'd worked in sales, he did this kind of tour guide thing part time, it paid quite well. And he gave me the spiel. He pointed to all of the window brothers and said they had a great time. They get lots of money, they're not pimps, they're independent contractors. He showed me all the live sex show venues, said that the women have a great time, a great laugh, they just have sex on stage with their boyfriends. He showed me the street areas behind the station. Yeah, this is all, I mean, some of the women might have been on drugs, but actually they behave themselves really well and the police treat them with respect, and because it's legal, the jobs aren't violent. So I said to him, how did you get to know all of this? And he said, oh, we're trained by the PIC. <laughs> so every single tour guide is trained by the PIC. What a protection racket. Can you believe that? Well, of course you can. But who'd have thought it? What a brilliant idea. Anyway, they're in trouble now, because lo and behold, they've been reported to the government and to the Ombudsman and to all various organisations that are going to have a look at their um, business plan, let's say. Because you actually can't spread false information and get away with it, particularly when you're making a profit from that. It would be like tobacco industry managers taking you around and saying nobody's died of lung cancer. So hopefully that will come to an end and that's such a huge plank of its and then again, I'm, I'm sticking to, to Germany and to Holland because they are two very obvious good news um, stories. But there are more which we can talk about later on as we go through the day. But similarly, there are moves ahead to stop talking to children in secondary school about how sex workers work about how this is in fact a job because they've noticed something, surprise, surprise, that none of the kids seem to want to go to the, um, what are those things you do when you're at school? Careers. Careers, yeah, careers advice. <laughs> I, I had a very bad school. Right? It was in Darlington. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, <laughs> well, we'll talk later. <coughs> All I'll say is ranks in the state. Anyway, so, these young people were going to careers advice day and saying, I'd like to be a sex worker. And this has been noted because, of course, prior to the disruption of this narrative, this unbreakable kind of narrative, parents would just assume that this was something that always been here, always will be, so we just have to go with the flow. Whilst at the same time noticing, that it was necessary to import women from other countries, all of whom were poor countries, in order to fill the void, because Dutch and German women didn't want to be prostituted. So, that's another piece of good news. There's been pimping operations that have been discovered operating in Germany and Poland, and they have actually been convicted. This used to be unheard of. I mean, it's a drop in the ocean, it's a grain of sand, but it's something. Because if you can read in the newspaper, a pimping gang has been convicted, and you're reading about it, sitting in Amsterdam, thinking they were operating 
80% of the window profits in the entire city of Amsterdam. I thought these women were sole contractors. And then, of course, the scientists, really, really brilliant scientists who were not particularly on any side of whether or not prostitution is harmful, whether or not legalisation works as good for a country or its citizens, have started to debunk some of the mythology that has held a lot of the human rights organisations in full support of worldwide, global decriminalisation and legalisation. And that's about AIDS and HIV. So in 2014, The Lancet, which as you know is an eminent um, publication read by um, doctors, other medical professionals, it gave an entire special edition to look at prostitution, sex work as they called it, and how to reduce HIV and tackle AIDS as a crisis. And it was actually funded by Bill and Melinda Gates. And that foundation takes an ideological position through the back door because it's funded anti-HIV initiatives. Now, who runs the clinics? Who runs the harm minimization um, NGOs, um, drop in centers for those at risk of HIV? Who is it traditionally? Gay men. Gay men who looked at harm minimization, looked at risky sex, risky behavior. Many of those, of course, contracting HIV were young, prostituted, sexually exploited men who, quite frankly, no one gave two hoots about. And so when they started looking at harm reduction and harm minimization, never eradication, of course, because that would be too, I don't know what, too feminist, maybe. <laughs> they set their ideology in stone. Sex work is work you do not ever stigmatize, you don't judge, and by which, they meant you don't ever call into question the abuse that these young men or older men are suffering. Ever. It's not talked about. And that, of course, had a ricochet effect on the services that were set up for women in prostitution because it's primarily HIV prevention. Much as we want that to be different, and there are brilliant exiting services now that don't just do harm minimization, they do exiting and they do proper holistic support. You know, this, this is what the ethos was. So, the Lancet Special Edition, with a load of cod science, and a load of not proper research, and a load of research in each other's articles, and a load of literature reviews that just put together all of their articles that already had said that legalisation makes it safer for the women and reduces HIV, concluded, surprise, surprise, that if you, if you criminal, decriminalise or legalise the entire global sex trade, what you will see in 10 years' time is a reduction of up to 46% in new HIV cases. Now that was massive. But you might be sitting here thinking, but who the hell reads the Lancet except for those elite few? Well, actually, that doesn't matter. Because what happened was, the headline of this cure for AIDS was on the front page of The Sun, The Mirror. It was on the front page of The Guardian. It was in the Financial Times, it was in it was in Nursing Times, it went absolutely everywhere where people that weren't these elite crew of medics would read. And so it came to be a truism. Well, legalisation or decriminalisation means it's safer for the women. And I'm going to tell you, and I'm probably reaching the end of the time now, but I'm going to tell you exactly what their three points were, because you'll laugh. But don't feel under any pressure to laugh. <laughs> I'm not a stand-up comedian at this stage. However, later it's a possibility. So they said, if you de if you legalise it, it will destigmatise it for the women. The Johns won't be as angry and they won't be as frightened. Therefore, there will be zero violence from the Johns. That's one. <coughs> to it, you will get 100% compliance with drop-in centres and with sexual health clinics with women attending. Three, the women themselves will always be able to insist that the Johns use condoms. 
I mean, as I was reading this, I was thinking, where was Mickey Mouse you know, writing the conclusions of this research? And I did a chapter about it in my book, helped by, because I couldn't have unpicked all of this stuff, it's really quite complex. But there's some researchers who just thought, I'm not having this bullshit. First of all, it's dangerous for those that are interested in HIV. And that's outside of the, the, the group of prostitutes and women, although they are seriously at risk for reasons we know, because of the rape. Oh, sorry, I forgot another one. They also said it would reduce prostitution. Anyway, so Michael Shively, who's one brilliant scientist, did a presentation that I happened to see a year after this came out, where he just spoke very, very coldly again about how this was utter bullshit. And in fact, the opposite would happen, which has happened in some states in Australia, and in the aforementioned countries, and in Nevada in the USA, that legalizes in some counties legalized brothel, where you've seen an increase of HIV, because of course you would if there's more prostitution, and the Johns know that they are not in any way being scrutinized by law enforcers and brothel members, which they have no so that other bit of good news, which I'm going to end on, is that if we can get all of these different groups of people who are extremely influential, government officials and legislators, the scientists and the medical professional, and the citizens that have been fed, you know, just the most extreme bullshit forever, then you will have a sea change. And too many women have been harmed in the meantime. Way too many women. This is the terrible news. This has been an unmitigated disaster, a terrible failed experiment with countless bodies to show for it. But it's about to change. And with Germany and the Netherlands both quite close to each other, and both with a seat at the table of the European, Par European Parliament, and with some feminists and others in the European Parliament that are also saying, this has failed. What are you going to do about it? That's great news. And the best, best news ever is that we have a model that we can point them to, the abolitionist model, that with all its minor failings and with the necessity to tailor it to each nation and improve the external services for women, we can point and say, that's what you need to do now. Thank you. Sorry much, Julie, and um, that's great to hear that news, and thanks for your hard work many years in um, getting, getting there. Um, thanks also for your absolutely brilliant interview and affiliate with um, J.K. Rowling, which uh, unfortunately wasn't video, as I understand it, and we won't be able to revisit it, but it was absolutely fantastic. I'll just say briefly, today is the sixth sixth anniversary of the day I first heard the term trans women are women and um, it's been a long six years and uh, my life went in a direction that I hadn't really anticipated from my low 70s. However, um, I was one of the, um, four years ago I was one of the founder members of Labour Women's Declaration and I would urge everybody here, if you don't already, to please support Labour Women's Declaration because uh, whatever you think of Keir Starmer, and I won't get into what I think of Keir Starmer <laughs> or Labour Party generally, they are likely to be the next government and uh, we need them to abandon self ID. And to come back to Julie, I uh, very much uh, appreciated hearing you say at Philia that it's important that in our campaign to reclaim the word woman, that we don't, we're not seen as allying with any extreme right wing people, even if they know what the woman is, well, it is, they do. They're not our friends. They would take every woman's right away that has been won over decades and centuries. And um, I don't know if you want to elaborate on that. 
to be the other two groups to be in the same other country. Would you elaborate on it now or do you want to take another question? Take another question. I think we've got a very large question. Yeah. Thank you. I probably can speak loud enough without the mic. <laughs> 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 so what's what's up? So, um, replacement. If the uh, Apple Lighthouse went off, you know the Apple. <laughs> okay. um, was, a few years ago, I was doing a masters in criminology, and I was in a room with thirty people talking about prostitution, and <coughs> I was the only one. I was a Mainly women, but some men as well. Young, uh, not as old as me, but you know, young and middle-aged people who was not pro legalising or decriminalising prostitution. How do we get into? Like the the tutor as well was very much been involved in some research. You know, well, they're talking to the sex workers. Yeah, you were talking about before. And um, how do we get into these people and stop them? Basically, telling our young people that this is an okay thing, that prostitution is fine, and it's a, you know, it's a choice, and feminists should be behind it because it's a, a woman's choice. And it isn't a choice, we know that. So, how can we help as a boss, is what I'm saying. Well, I'll take that one first and then I'll come back to you if I may. Um, sorry, I didn't see you. Um, well, I didn't. Offer any good news about academics, did I? No, we didn't. <laughs> right. <laughs> <laughs> quite frankly, there are, there is not. Although there are moves ahead uh, by some brilliant feminist academics who have been really under the cosh from censorship and bullying, who are speaking out about this, and we all know the issues that feminist academics get silenced on. By which I mean proper feminist academics, not the fake kind. And they are, it is the surrogacy as a human right, because of course now gay men are held up as the smoke screen. It's also um, the prostitution issue. It's anything that, ha that bad that happens to women is all of a sudden empowering. And also it's of course the gender issue, because that goes to the heart of what we're kicking back against in terms of the current level of misogyny. And as I often say, these men, these male academics that seem to be massive trans allies, talk about listening to trans women all the time. Well, if trans women are women, why do men listen to them so much? We do need to give as much support to those feminists in academia that are really struggling. That I've noticed a sea change within universities among some of the young feminists. Maybe they can't necessarily speak out publicly as yet, but they're meeting together. And these are students, postgrad students, and also junior and senior female and feminist academics. Most of the propaganda um, that comes out of universities now is pro prostitution. We've all heard, I'm sure, um, the number of not just women but also male students that are desperate to do some, do their PhD on the harms of prostitution or the success or whatever of, of the Nordy model and they've been told that's not going to work and they've been blocked from doing those studies which would really add to scholarship in this area. I've seen some of the worst, worst so-called research come out of universities that gets traction because of course it used to be that the impact, I, can't, I don't know anyone in academia will tell me soon, the recent used to be the research impact, research assessment impact, or oh, the RAE. The so RAE. The research so, assessment expert. Right, so it used to be that, was, is it yearly that um, the okay. staff would have to fill in, you know, mm -hmm. their kind of form saying what impact their research has been, you know, has had. And these days, quite frankly, it's getting on Women's Hour talking about. Um, how sex workers hate the Swedish model in Sweden, based on interviews with six of his mates, with six of her mates, and it just doesn't bear scrutiny at all. So we need to scrutinise those studies, we need to ask questions about them, but we need to nurture those academics, whether they're feminists or whether they're just decent academics with a pair, to do the research that actually will counter some of this bullshit. 
And you know, I had to fight tooth and nail to get my book, my prostitution book, into universities because I, I actually published it purposely with an academic publisher in order to get it in every single library. And it got in many of the libraries, but some of them they put warning stickers on, they put trigger warnings on, and I had to fight each and every one of them to do that. So you just have to resist. I had to buy my own copy. Right. <laughs> and our sister here, who's part of the uh, founder, I think you said, of the Labour Women's Declaration. Thank you for that, because it's a brilliant organisation, and we really appreciate the work that you've done and turning this around. And I was speaking at an event recently in London, the New Place UK event, on women in the press, and it was it was very passionately and loudly acknowledged what difference you've made to the current uh, political climate where women are now looking to Labour as potentially reformable, just to get back to some kind of sanity. So that's great. Um, in terms of the right-wing grift, okay, so often when I speak out about alliances with the religious right in the US or the hard right here in the UK, I'm told right-wing women need feminism as well. Well, yeah, really? Oh gosh, I didn't realise that women are women. Yes, I know. Feminism is for every single woman, and most women aren't feminists, but that doesn't mean that we don't care about women trapped in these horrendous communities, or with these men that wield power over them, living their lives as right-wing women. Some of them are not in any way trapped whatsoever, they just enjoy the power. That doesn't matter. What matters is, we're there for all women, but we do not, in my view, want to ally with those with the power to take away the rights that we fought for. So there's something more fundamental than this. Great for the women who aren't feminists, who denounce feminism, who blame feminists, as though we're all Judith Butler, for bringing in the gender ideology. I'm sick of hearing it. Okay, don't be a feminist then. And, and appeal to as many women that also don't like feminism, or people who don't trust feminism. And, and allow them to speak. I'm all for it. But what I'm not for is this notion that until the cavalry, the right-wing cavalry, or the populist cavalry came into town, we hadn't noticed that the house was on fire. <laughs> <laughs> because some of us have been noticing that for decades and decades. Some of us were the children that were locked in the burning house. And so what will happen when the gender war is won. Are they going to join to campaign against rape, against prostitution? No, I don't think so, although actually some of them will. And here's where I'm torn. I want to talk to every single woman who goes along to any of these events that are being organized by women who are denouncing feminism and blaming us for everything and say, do you know what? Feminism is lovely, it's welcoming. We're so nice. <laughs> and we'll even let you wear lipstick if you want. <laughs> we know how to have you at the party. So I want to, as many women to be drawn into feminism as possible. And I also really am sick and tired of hearing that at least Suella Braverman, for example, knows what a woman is, or even at least Donald Trump does. Well, yeah, because he rapes them. Of course he knows what a woman is. She wrote it in the 70s and the 80s. 
and she wrote it having been a young reporter on the Peter Sutcliffe, the, the disastrous um, hunt uh, and the misogyny in Curry, and many other examples. So she, she gives a good example of misogyny, but there are also some really poor ones around. And I've forgotten her name, but somebody who has written a book recently, she's an American, and she talks about, I'll, I'll find it for you for later, and it's one that basically is um, women are oppressed because we cave to misogyny. And actually, the opposite is true, isn't it? That we are terribly punished and in constant danger because we refuse to yield to misogyny, and that's the truth. So there are some bad ones that I find particularly useful because it sharpens your mind as to what it actually is. But I do think, and I'm, very, I'm guilty of this, absolutely I am, I try not to be, where we use the word when we mean sexist. And I think we should keep stick to the integrity of the woman hating or the female hating aspect of it. Because all misogynists are sexist, obviously, but not all sexist and misogynist. And I think, I think that's, we need to be careful. I think that's, that's where I get tripped up in, in the conversations that I'm trying to have with men in my community who are who think that who think that they're feminists. Um, and I'm trying to explain how um, I'm trying to explain you know, you're, you're nice guys but being a gentleman isn't the point. Any more questions for Julie? I would like to know um, if there's an organisation that I could join to help work on um, abolition or you know, whatever with the sex trade. And also the Lady of Women's um, Declaration. Um, when you say with we write to our MP, because um, I don't want to join the women, the Labour Women's Declaration, but can you tell me how to go from you mentioning these organisations to the activism of which what we would join? Well, Newcastle's got a terrible problem with brothels and flats and the like, uh, so why don't you start one? <laughs> start an organisation, seriously. I mean, it's what Leeds did when it had the so-called managed zone, right, Sandra? Um, where there's a problem there and you've got a few women who are like-minded, just start an organisation and see what support you can get from other groups that are further afield geographically. Just a national organisation? No. But, Sandra, do you, do you know... There's, yeah, there's no new model now, that's a national organisation. Oh, yes, um, yes, and they had a conference last week that I went to some of it and it was the really great speakers, sex trade survivors, other experts, and they've got a very good website that will take you around all the issues in terms of the legislation and testimonies and actions and stuff, so there's that, yeah. But I think that even if it's five, six women, <coughs> And there's something you can do to organise a group and say, we are this group. And then meet and talk about what's going on in the rest of the country and then go along to a national conference maybe as that group. You know, things do, things do grow from that every year. Um, hi Julie, you talked about um, academia and people within academia who are campaigning and trying to do actual research, but are necessarily able to be open about this just yet. Are there other fields, other industries, other lines of work where you think people might be mobilised or activated that we don't know about? And we should maybe look there and see if these people need a bit of support? Well, I heard a story recently that I then wrote about, which involves the um, Tavistock uh, Gender Identity Clinic that you've all heard about and you know the scandal of, of GIS. And of course, we know that this is a class issue, 
that it's upper middle class parents overindulging their spoiled kids who think they're the centre of the universe and basically cowtail to all of their needs and identities and the like, pretensions and so on. Um, stuff that only these kind of particular group of parents seem to have the time and resources to do. So one would expect that the highest number of referrals of the main um, group of, of young people presenting in gender clinics are girls, of course, teenage girls. You would think that the highest number um, would be from Brighton, right? Trans tinsel town. Yeah. Trans train is rolling, and Brighton is, is definitely driving it. Um, I'm just thinking then, um, I think the highest number of girls is actually in Blackpool. Yeah. So that's my point. Yeah. So then we discover, of course, that the highest number of referrals is from Blackpool, which is the second most socially deprived area in the UK, and it has more. Uh, higher numbers of kids in care than anywhere else, um, drug addiction, sexual abuse, convicted sex offenders gravitating to the town because of the additional vulnerability and because of the fairground and the pier and all of that. Highest number of referrals from Blackpool. These girls in hospital wards having self-harm, from eating disorders, from autism, having been sexually abused. What the hell is going on? How could this be? What do these girls all have? They all have a social worker, right? And what social workers are being trained in right now is a one-stop shop of problem solving amongst these sexually abused, self-harming, and or autistic girls that are just, well, want to escape your body, why wouldn't you go down the gender clinic? So I think social workers has to be our next Big job, how the hell we get into that country like that. We've got a few minute warning, probably two minutes now. So, one final question. It's not really a question, it's more of a point um, just on the social work aspect. I went to some training that was put on by the uh, Police and Crime Commissioner, and there was a social worker from uh, South Tyneside there who spoke about a little boy who was identified as a little girl and um, she was using mermaids on the case. Um, I did try and challenge but it was a you know difficult arena but I was incredibly concerned that she just threw mermaids out and I did say there are you know there are questions about that organisation, is that a right thing to do? But it was kind of just uh, push to one side, but I completely agree. Social work is a massive, massive area. I work in health and social care as the regulator, and um, again, another another area is uh, is those on-site bodies and other public sector organisations that have the responsibility for looking at these um, these services. So you know, trying to do what I can, but just wanted to 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 add that yeah, social work is a huge huge concern. Stop making me agree with you, because every time I nod, I go to Can we agree that Julie has done a pretty good job of doing some good, good um, news stories? Because he challenged her with that. <laughs>